During the 13A mission, um, what happened is we lost all three of the central computers and all three of the terminal computers, which <clears throat> are in what we call lanes below them. These are the computers that provide all, essentially all the critical functions um, uh, for the service module, uh, which include the attitude control system or the motion control system, depending <clears throat> on if you use the Russian or American acronym, the uh, life support system, um, thermal control system, you know, so your oxygen generation, your CO2 scrubbing, um, <clears throat> all those critical systems were lost during this failure. Typically, over the years, we've had many these computers um, fail and get single event upsets and fall and, uh, and, and crash and so forth. And typically, you're not running with all six computers, and so you'll just uh, reboot them, or go to another string, reboot the first string, and then um, uh, mode back and forth between your different strings of redundancy. And so it's not really a big deal. But when we did this um, during the uh, 13A flight, they, the computers were not coming back online. They immediately shut off right after we rebooted them. Um, this happened to happen right at the same time we had just connected the uh, S3, S4 segment where we just activated the 1A and the 2A channel. So we thought there was some uh, EMI or electromagnetic interference going on or some dirty power, some power spikes, maybe some grounding problems. We thought maybe uh, even some plasma problems um, with different conductivity um, uh, causing these computers to go down. So it just happened to happen during that. So that sort of sent us off in that direction and, and even delayed our um, um, uh, failure isolation even more. Uh, what we finally found out what was happening is the uh, uh, command processing unit, uh, what the Russians called the uh, BAC-3, um, and, and Cyrillic, if you will, is their acronym, uh, was actually sending erroneous commands to the computers to shut off. Uh, so we finally found out uh, that was happening, but it took us five days. So um, keeping in mind, this is the Russians you know, Ninth Space Station, typically the, the Russians are extremely resourceful and extremely clever on solving their problems. So when it took them five days to solve this, it shows you how difficult it was to um, wrestle with. And I think we all started to get worried on the American side after two or three days when the Russians had not figured out what the problem exactly was and had come up with a solution yet. So uh, this is a, 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 a extremely, uh, you know, um, significant event. It, considering the um, criticality of the computers and how long it took us to recover. We thought we had triply redundant computer lanes on the service module controlling all the critical functions, but what we didn't realize is that there's a command processing unit that feeds commands to all three computers. In that BOC-3 command processing unit uh, was sending erroneous commands. What we found out is that the BOC-3 was integrated into the vehicle right next to the condensate collection unit. Um, right where the separator lines go out. And so over the years, um, condensate uh, was collecting on the outside of this, what we call escave deva, um, and causing humidity to collect around these, and condensation to, to uh, collect around these connectors. It corroded the connectors and then got into the connectors, and that's what ended up causing these uh, erroneous commands, shutting off all of the um, service module computers, essentially defeating all of your redundancy. It just so happened the orbiter was docked during this time, which nobody can really agree. We'll never know with 100% certainty if there was any external factors during the assembly um, that caused this, but um, officially no one's ever been able to isolate that. So so for for my argument, I'm going to say it's, it's just fortunate this happened in a way that when the orbiter was docked, the orbiter can provide propulsive attitude control to the whole, what we call the stack with the station uh, mated to the International Space Station. So the um, uh, orbiter was able to provide this attitude control so we could troubleshoot this, and we were using some propellant um, consumables, but we found a way to do that, um, still get through the mission and have the orbiter give the, their normal extension days at the end after undocked and um, made it through there. So it was um, uh, um, f frightening failure for the station, uh, just taking that long to do it. So in the end, the Russians uh, jumpered um, this BOC-3 uh, connectors on the back of it, and we were able to circumvent this erroneous command being sent and just hot, essentially hot-wired it so it uh, would send the on commands instead of these erroneous off commands that were being sent by the BOC-3, and we were able to get, recover the computers. Now, if the orbiter wasn't there, we would have um, uh, been... I can't, you can't say that it would have been loss of station or anything, but you would definitely say it would have been a lot more difficult to 
to deal with, we would have had to probably powered up the progress or Soyuz vehicles and do some more manual, literally manual kind of attitude control and keep the station in thermally good attitudes while we um, did the same troubleshooting. So it really was provided a whole lot of uh, margin and cushion to be able to solve this problem while the orbiter was, was docked um, during this mission. I'm Mitch Davis. I work for the NASA Engineering Safety Center. I'm the Avionics Tech Fellow. And our responsibility is to tackle the, the tough problems across the agency when they occur. From the integration, what the Russians had done is they disconnected a connector that uh, the interface to the computers. There's a, a, a box called a Box 3, which takes different commands forms them into one and turns computers on and off. What they had done was disconnected that connector and put a jumper in there to hardwire the computers to stay on. So that was a temporary mitigation. And then what had happened was the next uh, shuttle flight, they'd went up and uh, put a new Bach 3, a new harness, and put in um, procedures to check for um, corrosion and contamination, or basically moisture around, around this particular unit. So getting back to the risk-based approach, you, you have... Uh, you have kind of a three-tier approach. First thing you want to do is eliminate the risk. If, if you see something like moisture, um, blockage of the, the filter, or the of, uh, limited airflow around an air condition, you eliminate that from the design. That would be the first step. And then the second step is once you've eliminated it, you try to decouple that particular fault from your, your assets you're trying to protect. So an, an example of that would be uh, physical separation of the air conditioning unit from the computer that, that may fail or the the, the critical systems that you do not want to fail. And the third thing you would do is on those critical systems, you assume that you've done everything you can to mitigate all risks, but if a bad day happens, what do you do? And there's where you fall back to a diverse, redundant system. That will be a, a robust approach to that particular problem. Get back to this particular, the, the, um, this particular cable on the block three and the connector. Uh, clearly, that cable and connector is a single point, single point failure or vulnerability in the system. Now, uh, one particular solution to that would be to split that into two commands and two harnesses. Well, if you looked at the front panel of the Block 3, over half those connectors were uh, showed signs of corrosion. So even if splitting into two connectors, we'd have only had 50% chance of, of not being corrupted on the other commands. The other possibility would be put on the opposite side of the station. Well, that may be practical for this one, but it's not practical for everything. So you really need to look at the sphere of influence of a particular fault. In this case, how far did the moisture go from the, uh, of the air conditioner? How, how big a sphere of influence does that have? And you'd want it to separate your, your six computers, or at least control and six computers and power for the six computers, far enough away so that one fault won't take out all six. When, when looking at this, it's the... So the key point is it's the, the sphere of influence of that particular fault and how it affects that particular implementation. So there's not one ultimate design that solves everything. What you're doing is you're balancing this risk from all the other risks so that all risks are equally improbable and that not one risk will, will take out your whole system. The sphere of influence of a, a particular fault, you need to consider also common cause. And common would be a common to the, the approach you put into resolving that, that threat. A um, common cause, would, for example, would be you, the sphere of influence of one fault hits both your primary and redundant system. So that becomes common to both of them. Another, pro, another example of common cause would be a common part in all your systems. So you would have to design your system such that if that fault were to occur, you have, a, you have an, another system to fall back on. Essentially why we use a, a diverse backup system. We try to use different parts because if we do have a common problem of parts, that, you would, that would catch it, and you still have a, a system to fall back to that was working. Long term, they put in um, a process to, to fall back to the uh, U.S. side control system when the Russian side goes offline. The, I believe the existing process used the Russian thrusters to do the handover, and that was just the, the standard process. So the, the current process is not to rely on the Russian uh, thrust, uh, thrusting to, uh, to control the station during the handover to the CMGs. And they also put in place um, periodic inspections for uh, moisture around the computer, uh, around, I'm sorry, around the air conditioning unit. And uh, that's another valid way you could move the air conditioning unit. Well, in this particular threat, 
So you can move the air conditioner into an area where it has moisture would have minimal impact to other systems, as well as put some type of monitoring in there that can detect the moisture and you would have, then have time to respond. Because the moisture takes weeks, if not months, to uh, mitigate itself into uh, contamination and corrosion on connectors. So, so common cause is really defined as the threat that you have in your system, the sphere of influence of that threat can in fact impact your primary and secondary systems. It's not a separate type of failure, but rather the sphere of influence of that failure affecting more than one design in your implementation. And the common cause is something you really need to consider as most of the reliability analysis looks at type of, uh, more, more at random failures and not a common cause failure.